Joe, we're finally here. It only took us five seasons. One of our one of our favorite guests to talk about the OC with Matt DeStefano. Hello, thanks for having me back. I'm uh, excited to talk about the end of the longest season in television history. Oh my god! I was thinking about that when I was watching this. Like, could you imagine any new show of television being like, we're going to do a 27 episode first season run? Like, other than reality impossible. TV now, where you see shows and it's like season one, episode 150 or something like yeah. that. I feel like scripted TV, no chance. You're not getting anyone roped in for more than 10 episodes. Nope, not at all. Not even no. a little bit. A lot happens in this episode for sure. Uh, I really thought absolutely positive that there was not going to be a baby still in conversation by the time this episode ended. I guess, I guess I'll figure out what happens in season two. Uh, but here we are, the tie that binds. We got a lot of shit happening. We got a wedding. We got you know, some sailing. We got, we got a baby. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just just some like yeah. Sailing. It's it's almost like they forgot for the entire season that Seth was into sailing and having a boat, and then it just came back out. Oh, you're like, oh yeah, he he. That was his personality. Uh, aside from the comic books and you know the nerd stuff, that was a large chunk of his personality that disappeared after the beginning of the season. So we start off this episode. Seth and Ryan are looking at the ocean, and Seth is spitballing great names for the baby, uh, which involved Thor and Seth uh, were his his name suggestions. Um, and the flip side is like, as this is all going on. Marissa, I still feel like just being completely unreasonable about this situation a little bit. Yeah, it's it's just shy of the Ross Rachel. Yeah. We were on a break. Like I, that's what I wanted Ryan to yell in that moment. We were on a break. <laughs> it, it's like we were on a break, or you know, you didn't believe me when I said that you were well, in yeah, danger. Yeah, that's one of my favorite parts of this episode. Is but I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but when Seth is the voice of the entire audience. And it's like, yes. Marissa, everything that's happened has been your fault. <laughs> and just yeah. points the finger. We're like, yes, that's where we're all. We all agree that you are the reason for Ryan's ruin. Yeah. He's like, Teresa wouldn't even fucking be here if you didn't date that psychopath, bring that psychopath Oliver into our lives mm -hmm. for for seven very long episodes or whatever it was. Can I, I want to share something before we get too into the episode. I think this is something okay. fun that t the two of you should do as you're continuing to watch. Uh, the last time I was on the show, I shared that my wife and I were watching this show. She'd never seen it before. We just wrapped it up uh, about a week or two ago. But something that we started doing was gambling on the voice who says, welcome to the OC, or not welcome to the OC. Let me say that again. The uh, voice that says previously on the OC. Oh. So what we both would do is before we started to watch, would you the two of you could do this separately, we would bet, you know, I'd say it's going to be Ryan or she'd say it's going to be Kirsten. And we'd bet we started with just a dollar and then the stakes were too low because we were getting it wrong. So we we're like five bucks a pop and just had a running bet throughout the whole series. So I encourage both of you to do that. There's different things factors that come into play where uh for predictions but i think that's something you should do maybe higher stakes i don't know um you guys can get, gamble things that you own against each other i don't know yeah i'm i'm down with this we could we could at the end of the episodes before our next recordings we can make our prediction on who will say it okay all, all right. right we'll keep that in mind <laughs> we'll try to remember that by the end of this specific episode <laughs> right yeah who's who's gonna <laughs> kick us off in uh in season two that's the uh yeah, thing to guess. I'm saying, I'm I'm putting my if if it's about being fast, I'm saying Ryan. I think Ryan is exactly who needs to tell us previously on to kick off season two. I'm gonna say it's I'm gonna say it's uh, I'm gonna say it's Kirsten. Okay, all right. I'll write that down. <laughs> What's what are the stakes? Yeah, write that I down know. right now. What are what are you gonna gamble against each other? You got to make it real. For the listeners out there. Oh, okay. Um, ooh, should we do like money or should we do like I, dares? Let's start, dares? Let's start with money no, and see. No, no, no money. <laughs> I was like, Matt, I know you. You were like, you know, you you would not do money. Come on, let's dares. do some dares. All right. let's, let's get, let's play. Well, Joe, I'll let's let get, you put the first dare on the table then. <laughs> oh, shit. Um, okay. If, 
Uh, okay, hold on. What happens then, Matt, if we don't, Matt D, if we don't, if it's neither a of us get it right? The only one we did was okay. the, the finale of season four. We made a bet with who was closest, and there was different variables that, that fell into that. But I ended up, I yeah, it was an easy pick for me. I ended up winning that one. Uh, but yeah, absolutely dares. There needs to be a dare on the table. It can carry over okay, to the next okay. week. I think they should be OC centric dares, maybe. If there's something that you can think of, like go up and just <laughs> punch a water <laughs> water polo player, or <laughs> I don't know. You know what? Okay, so Matt, if 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 I get it right, then you will have to hold on, hold on. OC centric dare. Okay. I think I have one actually. If you're still struggling, <laughs> let's hear it. You look so bummed about then the one you have in your head. <laughs> yeah, you scared. you're gonna have to. Uh, okay, hold on. Maybe you should go first because you I don't have one yet. So you okay? Should go first, so, then. Joe, if I'm correct, you have to take <laughs> a selfie of yourself in the shirtless Seth Cohen happy trail ah! <laughs> and post it on our Instagram story. <laughs> Fine. I all right. Okay. Okay. Oh my god. Right after this, I'm gonna go and is that the bet? Is that the bet for both? Um, I think that should be both what you're both held accountable for. I think for. that I'm I think that's both on the line of either I think that's fine. I think that's fair. I like that. All right. I love that I introduced this. Um that's gonna give me a like if it is me, it's gonna give me a couple days to like figure out how to like orient. Get the lighting <laughs> right. <laughs> Get the lighting right and get like, you know, get a rig together to put the, you know, the the phone above my bed just so. <laughs> okay, I like it. All right. Oh. The chaos that Matt has already the levels. brought already. This is chaos magic, yeah. Wanda. Oh. I'm here for it. All right. Okay. So let's talk about, there's a lot that's happening. So let's just kind of look at everything from the individual uh, spots. And I feel like the lowest tier story we can start with is the everything going on in the Seth and Summer side of things, which is essentially that Summer has taken sex off the table for for a bit. Um, there's a few good lines. There's a few good moments in here. She's talking about how she's her best friend is so upset to which Seth goes, Princess Sparkle is <laughs> upset. <laughs> um, classic, classic Seth line. Uh, I do think it's insane that Summer believes that Marissa and Ryan are the quote unquote perfect couple because mm -hmm. there's not a lot of evidence to support that claim throughout this first season. There's also not much that makes me think they have literally anything in common. <laughs> no. <laughs> there's no shared interests. There's nothing that are the the hallmarks of a no, I mean they're in high school, so that doesn't necessarily have to be the case, but yeah, finding each other really sexy seems to be the only thing that they have in common with each other, which is, I think, on par for high school dating for the most yeah. part. Anyway, Ryan's just attracted to trauma. He's a attracted to he has the hero complex where he's just yes. trying to save whoever's around, and she constantly needs to be saved because she's an idiot, and makes terrible decisions. <laughs> See, that's like it's weird that like Ryan has that both in common as, but has the hero complex, which is also a trait that's common in like the manic pixie dream girl. <laughs> yeah, it's it's like this attraction to like chaos and yeah. Trauma. So there's a little bit of that, like you said, she takes sex off the table. Most of the quotes that I wrote down come from the two of them because they're really the only source of comedy in this very, very heavy episode. <laughs> Otherwise. Uh, so mm -hmm, there's the scene mm -hmm. where Seth is Seth is trying to sell the boat to like get money to help out Ryan and Teresa, and Summer's there, and she goes, "I can't believe your boat's name is Summer. Like, what a coincidence!" And I just wrote "Summer um, is dumb" in my notes. Like, yeah, yeah. it's so <laughs> obvious. Like, it's already the been shared that, that he had, the... had a crush on you forever. Yeah, she. The fact yeah. he had to spell it out to her at the end of the episode, I'm like, wow. Uh, and then she does have the good line of, well, it's probably going to be the only summer you're riding for a while, um, which good. It's like almost negates the dumb summer yeah. part because that is a witty ass line to come out next. But it's like so dumb, right? Like it's it's dumb writing because in like a previous episode, I don't know if it was two or three episodes ago, but like she see, she goes through the yearbook and sees him like in one man clubs yeah. like alone. So he she is aware that he is like profoundly lonely. Yeah. 
in in Newport. And for and also like, you know, she's not dumb to the fact that he's like been awkward around her and is attracted to her. But even in that moment, it's just like it's not believable for me to think that like she just doesn't get that he's always had this thing for her. Let me ask you guys a question, because I felt like this watching this episode. Do you think that this episode was written in a way that it still felt like it was wrapping up a story if they didn't get renewed for a second season? Because there's a lot of like tying up storyline conversation that's just like tossed throughout this episode. Like Seth being like the boat's named after you. Like there's like all these random things that I'm just like. Did they still not know that they were getting a second season yet when they were writing this episode? I mean, I think they had to have known because they kept tacking more episodes onto this season and making it longer and longer. Yeah. But I do agree. it's mm-hmm. It does have that energy of it's even that that shot that brings you back to the first episode uh, that's, you know, Ryan pulling out of the driveway. Um, it takes you back to the start of kind of where everything is like, OK, Ryan's this kid who came from Chino and no matter what was laid out in front of him that's the kid he will always be like it could have just ended there put him back Seth is a loner Marissa is just this Newport girl who has parents that she hates and you know all that sort of stuff so it it sort of puts everyone back where they started so I think it very could have easily been the end you could have wrapped it up there fortunately it's not there's a lot more to come Matt but (laughs) uh, I think yeah I totally agree that it felt that way there's certain scenes of dialogue where I feel like I would not I would not put like a scene a scene like Seth talking about how important Ryan was to him in the episode if I didn't think that there was at least a slight chance that this was the last episode or even like the scene between Ryan mm-hmm. and Sandy in the pool house like there's there's these moments where it's like you're almost the you're almost like kind of blowing your load on the emotional beats of these characters so early in that sense but I'm interested to see what happens because I've heard from pretty much any OC fan that like season two is just like a home run of a season of television with just like funny, crazy, like everything that you wanted out of the OC is is season two. They really know what they are. So I'll also say so. the this whole Seth being upset about Ryan leaving and feeling abandoned and how you know it's going to completely change his life he's just disconnected from subreddit and all of this. I'm literally watching this. I pull up my phone I'm, and I pull up Google Maps. I'm like, how long does it take to drive from Newport to Chino right now? And at the time, it was probably about 6 a.m. Pacific, to be fair. But at that time, 38 minutes. That was the drive <laughs> time. So let's 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 double that on, you know, crazy rush hour L.A. traffic. He's moving an hour away. Yeah, you could do a quick like weekend visit do a quick overnight if you want to go drive over there at yeah. night yeah like yeah. it's oh that's a longer commute than a lot of people have that they do every day <laughs> <laughs> that is that is true let's go to the yeah. california expert here yes <laughs> what, what's Joe, so tell us it's here's so okay so here's the thing right is that it is far enough away like not just distance physically distance but also like emotionally and like everything like it's you know it's far enough away that you really have to think about it like you know i really have to prepare myself emotionally to go to drive up to la because like it used to be two and a half hours and now it it used to be two two and a half hours and now it's like two and a half three hours to get up there um, to get up even into like even to just Orange County. So like modern times, yeah, I can see that. However, Matt De Stefano, to your point, right? It is not that far away at all. And if you really miss them, like it's also like the internet is just a thing. <laughs> like there's ways to talk to people. They have phones. There's texting now. Like what you're? It, he's not like moving across the country which is not a big deal. And also, again, it was like, it was, it kind of bummed me out how annoyed I was at Seth in this episode because he's being so unreasonable and making Ryan having to leave to potentially take care of his, like, child and, you know, his baby mama about him. Um, 
Yeah, there's there's a point where Ryan is just staring at Seth in silence, and it lasts so long. I thought that something had frozen on my TV <laughs> for a second. Um, oh wait, after he hands him the map. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's a really long pause. Uh, all right, so you know, you, I didn't even think about this because they have not once acknowledged the internet existing in this entire season. But like, I was alive when the show was airing. The internet definitely existed. So here's the question to end all questions. What is the first AOL instant message that Seth Cohen sends Ryan Atwood when he gets to uh, Chino and sets up his computer? <laughs> I don't think Seth is the one to send the first message. I think that's your that's the flaw of your question right there, Matt. No, fair enough. What is Seth's away yeah. message? I think that everything... <laughs> yes, what is Seth? That? Seth and everything that we're seeing in this episode is going to be just, like, holding this grudge and is too salty. And that's, like, it just doesn't make any sense to me that he's, like, faulting Ryan for doing what he feels is his duty, right? It's, he feels duty-bound to her. Yeah. To go back to your point, uh, Kelly, about, like, the the idea that this is like it could could it just end here right i think that there were just so many cliffhangers like there were way too many clip like the ryan bit pregnancy of it all the marissa i think marissa moves into the model home i i don't know if that's a thing but like it feels like she's moving into she well she moves into the, the you know casa yeah. cooper nickel yeah, yeah. <laughs> and like takes out that little vodka and starts swigging again and i'm like uh oh all that all that clean living she's been doing for you know this last half a year of this of this season and then you see like seth and i i have this so clearly in my mind um like an episode of wa uh, watching an episode of best week ever on vh1 and they're talking about the season finale and like Michelle Buteau or someone is like, where the hell's he going? <laughs> where the hell's he going? He say so you and so Matt, when you said like you Googled like how far how long is it gonna drive to Chino? I Googled how long will it take to sail to Tahiti from Newport Beach? <laughs> and I was like, in that little like catamaran bullshit, like there's no Yeah, he way. said forty two like, days in no the episode. Way. He he's not gonna survive on that. Yeah. He, he, no Dude, this whole second season of the OC should just be cast away yeah. starring Seth Cohen. It is. <laughs> like, Replace Wilson. He's, he's talking yeah, to Captain Oak. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I would watch that. Can we reboot that? <laughs> All right. So I think we've covered most of the Seth and Summer of this episode. Let's dive to, we'll save Ryan and Teresa for last because that is really the bulk of it. So let's talk about the Caleb, Julie Cooper, uh, unholy matrimony that is uh, about to happen uh. as Sandy calls it. Um, the, the Cooper Nichols. Yeah. I, the, one of the other notes I wrote down that doesn't tie to any of the storylines per se, but there's a scene and it's a pretty long scene of Sandy and Caleb having a conversation that is essentially about property line and all this mm -hmm. other stuff. And I said, you know what? Teen dramas these days definitely <laughs> lack plot lines about what the cost of property lines are yeah. in the town. <laughs> like, Did you feel like you were watching was, the Star yeah. Wars prequels with all the... Uh... Yeah, you're just like, yeah, you're like, man, I wish that my Star Wars <laughs> movies had way more government conversations. <laughs> <laughs> like, all right, what are, what are our thoughts here on, on everything happening in the scope of... We'll just call it the adults. Everything happening with the well, adults in this episode. Well, I, for one, would love to get married at the Wayfarer's Chapel. <laughs> it's beautiful. Um, it's also, like, the perfect... See, that's the other thing, right? Is that every show, like, has to have a wedding. And I started... I realized this because I've been watching the last season of The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. And they had like they started out the show started out starts out with a wedding but like in the last season they do have a wedding and i'm like you gotta have you gotta have a wedding you gotta have at someone get one. married some you know well it's at least one and so they're doing that code. in the first season the the wedding is the wedding is always a cheat code in television especially if you know it's like the final season or whatever as like an easy way to get all of your favorite characters under one roof for a reason. <laughs> like, it's like, oh, here it is. I have a lot of thoughts about the wedding. <laughs> so, the what, what? I never know. I've seen this so many times. What are the ties that they're wearing? The groomsmen and Caleb? 
I didn't like Google. I've never seen a style tie like that. It's like a bolo, but it's an untied bolo, very loose and billowy. Um, Hold on, now I'm now I'm not remembering. Hold it, on, no, I'm, it's I'm, like I'm a looking scarf it up right now. Almost, it's not a good look. While you're looking that up, why is Ryan a groomsman? Was there no one else? That's a pet peeve of the the lack of realism in a show is when just the convenient characters in the cast are put in the wedding party. Like, there's no world yeah. in which Ryan is a groomsman in this wedding. My last <laughs> beef with this wedding is among you know everything about the wedding but there's not a lot of music in this episode i know you guys talk about music and we'll probably get there but there's this cover of maybe i'm amazed are you about the, are you about <laughs> the same thing that i complained about is it Hold on a is second. it the gender pronoun switching yeah hate it you just keep those words how they were written yeah <laughs> yeah what's who's has a problem with singing the song the way it was uh such a <laughs> such a problem with that i i hate when people do the, the gender pronoun switching in covers yeah the the maybe i'm a girl maybe i'm a lonely girl <laughs> who's in the middle of something just doesn't it doesn't even roll off the tongue in a pretty way yeah <laughs> like, <laughs> no no not a good look uh no. <laughs> we'll get in there there's actually yeah. shockingly more songs in this episode than than i thought there was at the time i was watching it <laughs> but we'll get there soon but yeah, I did have that written down that I was like, oh, I hate I hate artists who just I saw like a tweet one time that was like, don't change the pronouns in a song. If you're a guy singing a love song that a woman wrote to another guy, you are just gay for those four minutes. You, and go. you just got to go forward with it like that. Is, that's Correct. how it works. Joe, did you find um, a picture of the ties from the wedding? I, I see exactly what you're talking about. So so here's the thing. They they're like classic like ascot sure. ties like you i think this is similar to what they wore in like the father of the bride movies like it's very it's so it's sweet. very classic <laughs> what sucks about it or what like bothers me about it is just like the straight like tie pin right in the center looking like it's the fuck like one of the infinity stones <laughs> that you need to pluck you know like it's just it's it's awful. Yeah. <laughs> Ascots are fine, but like that with the little pin, it just looks Not bad. A good look. yeah. Yeah. It's a bad look. Uh, let me see. What else do I have written down? Oh, we got to talk about, we got to talk about this awkward fucking scene where Marissa and Jimmy and Kirsten's sister are moving Marissa's stuff into the new house. And it is just like bad quippy attack dialogue at each other for like two minutes before Marissa has like the enough. I'm sick of my friend, my adults fighting in my life and like storming out. But like, there are some bad disses in there. <laughs> like, like she, she says something where it's like, like, Oh, I, I can't be shocked that you couldn't get Kirsten. So you're dating the next best thing. I believe in psychology. They call that transference. And he's like, well, I believe Marrying Caleb Nickel in psychology is called being a, a greedy uh, money whore. <laughs> it's like it's like, dude, Jimmy, that is not even a good. You really That's not a great comeback. There, there's opportunities for better jokes there. What I was, what I didn't like yeah. there was Julie's like, oh, Jimmy, why are you here helping Marissa move her things? It's like Julie, you're clearly not helping her. Like, who else is gonna help her move her stuff? Why are you surprised by that? <laughs> Julie's like, I can hire a brown to do this. Yeah. <laughs> like, so ridiculous. The the adults in this show, uh, I hope they never change. So wait, while we're <laughs> talking about the adults, Sandy is very out of character at, in this episode where he's like berating Kirsten for talking to Teresa and having an open conversation with her about whether or not to keep well, this yeah. baby. And Sandy basically comes in and is like, you talked her out of killing that baby. Like, yeah, this is going to destroy our marriage. Why would you're going to ruin Ryan's life? Like, I don't know. He, he has way too much stake in the game there of about that decision. He should be like in character with, for Sandy would be whatever decisions the best for the two of you. We will support you anyway. Yeah. And that is totally not who he I want to read the scene. two notes that I wrote back to back. Um, Cause I, my notes are mostly just like trying to remember plot beats that happen and I try to inject a little bit of humor in them but I wrote Teresa's going to terminate the pregnancy this is how they're going to save raw dog Ryan <laughs> <laughs> and then the very next line says except that five minutes later Kirsten changes the decision for them 
Like, it is so... You get the, like, I'm not going to have the baby. And then it's literally the next scene is, like, Kirsten, like, but are you sure about that? And then she's like, you know what? You're right. Good argument. I am going to keep the baby. Yeah, sold. <laughs> I'm, I'm very curious. I'm going to s- still repeat what I said last week. I'm still curious to see how they get rid of this baby. Because while I've never watched the OC... <laughs> I am. I feel like if there was a baby for three seasons on this show, I would have known about it. I don't know. Maybe so, not. Like, There's a lot of stuff I forgot about I, watching the show again. Uh, <laughs> Matt, out of context, it's like you're wanting to see a late term abortion. Yeah. Like, <laughs> look, out of. I mean, I'm sure what we're going to find out is that it's actually Eddie's kid. That seems like the the biggest out, but. Uh, Whatever. Oh, I cannot wait for season two. Matt, now. <laughs> I wish in this. It's the thing I miss about like some of the the streaming culture of going back and watching shows. You don't have to wait three months to see what happens. Yeah. You in a week, you're gonna be good. I think you should. They're probably on YouTube. The uh, the preseason like sizzle commercials they would do for these. I feel like you should look those up and watch them beforehand to kind of go in with that same mindset. But yeah. Just feel feel the the months of anticipation b- brewing. Yes, yeah, try to build that <laughs> into a short period of time. Because right now you're like, oh, I wonder what they're gonna do with the baby, and then it's like a day later. Oh, that's what they do with the baby. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm just gonna hit play on the next <laughs> right, episode right. tomorrow right and be like, it. oh, problem solved. Have you a question? This has nothing to do with the OC, but in this day of streaming, <laughs> have you ever been watching a show, and it's like the whole show's on there? And you're like, all right, I'm going to go to bed after this episode. And the episode ends on a cliffhanger. So you're like, all right, I'm going to watch the first three minutes of this next episode just to get a resolution. Then I'm going to go to bed and finish it. I haven't. I, oh, I'm old I have, school. I have... I'm not a binger. I like the experience of uh, having that little bit of time to think about something. I have definitively done that with multiple Netflix reality shows. Oh, okay. Where it'll be like, oh, no, she's got to make a choice. And then like cuts to credits and i'm like all right I gotta i'm gonna let choice. the next two minutes of this next episode play find out what the choice is and then go to bed and figure out how the what the ramifications of that choice are uh i think i used to do i used to do just watch the whole next episode yeah and then kind of be fine because it usually will settle into the season two plot and stakes um now i'm like no i gotta go <laughs> it's like i'm going to bed i cannot yeah i cannot stay up for this anymore so we get the big ending scene. We get almost the entire length of Jeff Buckley's Hallelujah here in this scene as we yeah. see where all the characters are going. And I'm not going to say that I cried watching an episode of The O.C. That still hasn't happened. Oh, not yet. But not yet. We'll get there. But the shot of Kirsten crying while like stripping Ryan's bed in the pool house. I definitely got one of those like hiccups where I was like, oh, man, I might. This might happen. And then it cut to Seth's dumbass like sailing away and whatever like whatever emotions were building up like immediately evaporated because I was like, wait, what? What is Seth doing? Yeah, <laughs> like, because at that point you know that if you started, you would look up and it's like Seth leaving, and you can't you can't shed tears right. for that no. for that. Nonsense. Can we talk no. about um, since we're kind of jumping towards the end? I had a my favorite part of the episode is it felt like. I can't think of a specific example, but let's let's think of uh, Bruce Wayne uh, abandoning the Batman mantle for a while and yeah. comes back. And the first time he puts on the cape and cowl, you get that energy when Ryan is moving out and he has the gray hoodie and the leather jacket on. I'm like, all right, we've got Chino Ryan back. He's going to go <laughs> and raise a child or something or whatever. But it, it was very uh, it was very fulfilling to have him kind of back in that episode one outfit and just like the rawest, you what you can call him raw dog Ryan. That was raw dog Ryan <laughs> right there. With the- yeah, that's raw dog Ryan right there. That's Chino Ryan. He don't give no See, fucks. But, <laughs> but he's forever. So yes, like I I agree with you, Matt. That like it's it was like oh like so that's why he's hot. But see, the thing is though is that he is forever changed by the OC because he doesn't have the choker. Just the leather bracelet. <laughs> yes, just leather bracelet. No, like and the team beat choker. haircut. I'm dropping into this kind of fresh. Haven't been watching this this whole season, the first season, kind of in order as you have been. Just kind of dropped in and watched this episode. And his hair changes so drastically from the beginning. He's got the, the teen beat heartthrob um, 
sort of like feathered hair with the uh tips the blonde frosted tips kind of kind of vibe highlights mm-hmm, mm-hmm. it this is a different ryan he's putting on the uh, the leather jacket and the hoodie but this is a different man than the beginning of the season you know uh this is i'm going to use weird al as an example but i know that there are way more uh famous people than this but you know like those those actually like a britney spears or a beyonce you know like when they tour and they have all these costume changes like their costumes almost have like a security decal uh, protecting them, right? Like, do you think that after they shot that first episode of the OC with Ryan's original clothes, there was like this like under locking key? We've got to save this for the for the season one finale. We need this leather jacket and gray hoodie. You need the callback in back. pristine condition. <laughs> like, yeah, absolutely. You need the callback. I hope that's all yeah, hanging up in a museum somewhere. <laughs> yeah. For for 26 episodes, there was round-the-clock security watching those, uh, that outfit to make sure that it was safe. Meanwhile, in New Jersey... So, Marissa, what talking points do you want to hit on in this week's episode? Well, Jackie, let's talk about how the film addresses the patriarchy. Ooh, and representation of marginalized people. Ooh, ooh, and even philosophical ramifications of good versus evil and horror. We can point out the triangle boobs, talk about the blood splatter, and oh, the practical effects. <sighs> um, and also the male gaze. My gaze at the males. hi From feminism to fangirling, the Jersey Ghouls cover all the bases of horror from a woman's perspective. New episodes are uploaded every other Sunday. Just search Jersey Ghouls to find us on social media and your favorite podcasting app. You guys ready to talk about some music? Yeah. Can we talk about the posters on Seth's wall? Uh, the only thing I've mentioned is that I always notice his Ben Folds Live poster directly above the bed. Yeah, there's a Ben Folds one. There's an Adam and his package one, which is that, I've called that such out a before. specific yeah, the... reference, which is perfect because he is exactly who would be listening to Adam and his package. Yeah, I just wanted to call out the Adam and his package. Since there's not a ton of music in this episode, Adam and his package so... appearing in poster form in any television show. And, and it making sense. You know, I feel like a lot of teen drama shows, they'd get the press kits from a record label that's like a bunch of different band yeah. posters. And they're like, yeah, we're just putting this on as set dressing and it doesn't make sense in the context of the show. Yeah, I think I've mentioned when I saw the Adam and his package poster for the first time, I was like, there's no way that that was sent to them by a record label. Yeah. Like that, that had to have been someone's call yeah. that this is the type of artist he definitely listens to. So I get the list of songs from tunefind.com. Uh, if you're ever trying to figure out, hey, what's that song from my favorite episode of my favorite TV show, tunefind.com. Is a this great episode story. sponsored by tunefind.com. Find Use the com. promo code Matt Kelly for. <laughs> <laughs> I don't but, think it costs money. But, um, but there's. So you can put. People can leave comments on the songs. And this was the first time that I saw not one, but two songs that were definitively not in the episode and people really angry in the comments about it, which was that Toonfine listed uh, the vines get free and the phrase uh, uh, over my head as being in this episode. <laughs> and like the one person's like, no, like it was all caps. No. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then in parentheses, it said still a great song, but not in this episode again in all caps. Uh, so just wanted to throw those out there. They're not in contention. They also had shit like Here Comes the Bride. Like, I don't really consider that music in the episode of the OC. Like, yeah. the actual songs, the needle drops, as we'll refer to them. There was Gem Flying High. That plays when Marissa and Ryan are having a chat. Um, Alexi uh, Mordouche? Mord- I don't know. Aren't Sky. That song comes back. That was in an earlier episode. That comes back. It's playing uh, in the restaurant when uh, Kirsten is trying to talk to Teresa. Iron and Wine's The Sea and the Rhythm is playing when they're having the most chill beach party I've ever seen in my entire <laughs> life. Um, not the sound. Sa- I'll tell you what. I love Iron and Wine. Not the sound of having a bonfire on the beach. <laughs> like Not my number one pick there. Uh, Jem comes back again and sings Maybe I'm Amazed as the wedding dance song uh, and changes the pronouns. Very upsetting. And then, as we mentioned, ends with Jeff Buckley's Hallelujah. Uh, I don't think that this is much of a debate on what was the song of the episode. Can I can I hijack this for a minute and ask? Okay, so 
Ken, let's offer up why we think it's not Hallelujah. <laughs> because it is like how this like this moment is what makes me fall in love and introduces me to Jeff Buckley's Hallelujah and then by extension, like, you know, Leonard Cohen and all of that stuff with it. But like, honestly, though, I kind of loved Maybe I'm Amazed. Like, let's just flat out know that like the song of the episode is Hallelujah. Is Hallelujah. <laughs> But like, so we're just maybe all, I'm amazed. We're just all putting our votes I, for second place for song of the episode. Like we've all yes, agreed exactly. it's Hallelujah. <laughs> like, yes. So like for second place, I say maybe I'm amazed. Again, I'm like you. I don't like I don't like a changing of pronouns. You're gonna have to deal with it the way queer people have dealt with like singing music about this all like the entire like history of popular recorded music. <laughs> but I do love the moments that we get with all of the couples, right? I get like we have the Cooper Nichols, you know, and then we have like Sandy doing what he does when he looks at Kirsten and Jimmy and Haley. And then like, you know, even with Ryan and like the moment that they have there and then eventually like, you know, leading to um, the moment with Seth and uh, Summer on the like overlooking the water. So I really loved all of that for this. It's also just like the it's such a needle drop and it's a cover. So it's like it's a wedding band and like I'm like, OK, obviously, <laughs> obviously, Caleb did not choose this as their first. <laughs> Who <dance> did, song. <laughs> though? <laughs> it doesn't seem like a Julie pick either. She It sounded like she would add like photograph by Def Leppard or something. Well, I mean, yeah, it was like, what did what, Bob Seger? Yeah, where's the, where's night the moves? Bob Seger for this? <laughs> yeah, it should have been Night Moves. And you cut to a sad Luke somewhere crying as the wedding. Yeah, happening. where was Luke rushing yeah. the altar, by the way? Like, yeah. why did that not happen? I I was thinking about this the other day because I'm like, the last Luke storyline I remember is him wrapping a car around a tree and I haven't heard from him since. Is he just dead? Did they just kill Luke? <laughs> no, they mentioned that Luke went to go live with uh, right, his gay right. dad. Oh, that's right. All right. But I feel like Luke is coming back. I don't think that Luke is fully written off of this show, is he? So wait, how much do you love Luke, first of all? We're not going to tell you what happens, by the way. Yeah, I love yeah. You need to live I like we Luke. lived watching this show, Matt, without knowing <laughs> what's around the next corner. But yeah, we the first time that we chatted, Luke was a totally unlikable character. How do you feel he's great. at this point? Yeah, he's the so Rooney, great. The Rooney episode. The Rooney episode was a real turning point for Luke yes. for me. <laughs> uh, all right. So on your on your criteria that it can't be Hallelujah, let me paint you a picture. <laughs> it's, Please do. It, Sicily, yeah. nineteen seventy one. It's, it's <laughs> Matt Kelly's freshman year of college in two thousand four, two thousand five. Uh, the Garden State soundtrack has been all the rage, and uh, a folky guitar cover of Such Great Heights has taken over my entire everything. And I go to the record store and decide I'm going to buy an Iron and Wine CD. And I grab the C and the rhythm because it's a cheap EP that I can use to like get a vibe for Iron and Wine. And that CD sat in my car and played constantly for my whole freshman year of college. So the fact that of all of the Iron and Wine songs and this long tapestry of music that this artist has created the open like the title track of the first album i ever bought by that artist is the one that just randomly pops up in the worst juxtaposition of music to scene i've ever witnessed before my very eyes mm -hmm. i'm gonna go with iron and wine if if hallelujah didn't show up in this song in this episode that probably would have been my pick anyway for the like if we're going with what is the song that takes us to the time in which this episode was released then that is Iron and Wine signed, sealed, and delivered for me. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. I agree with you, Matt. My number two, I, I mean, I'd pick either. The, can I pick Phantom Planet? Uh, I don't think any of the music <laughs> in this episode out of Hallelujah is, is great. Uh, but I, I also don't think the Iron and Wine drop is that bad of a choice for that scene. It's not like a raging beach party. They're like, no, it, it's this kind of sad moment where they're talking about their friend leaving and their friend's life being, you know, ruined by teenage pregnancy. Um, <laughs> so I I actually kind of yeah. I think that one is a good fit. But yeah, I'm not um, I'm not a huge th for a show that has a lot of great music throughout the entire series. And I think Hallelujah is like one of the big music moments in this show. Um, the rest of it 
didn't really do it for me in this one, including Jem. And do we know, was that actually Jem in the wedding? I don't know what Jem looks like. I think someone said that it was. Yeah. I just Googled pictures of Jem, and I still am not 100% sure. Now, again, this is coming from the Toon Find <laughs> comments page, which is not uh, not exactly what I would call the ideal source for for researched information also how can she just call herself gem like it's spelled yeah. the same as gem and the holograms like yeah. is that even if it's a fake band is that can you just do that yeah so i don't know what this <laughs> okay so it says gem and then again in all caps someone was very excited <laughs> in the cat with caps locks gem actually is on the show to sing this one I got confused because they used the number two and the number one in that sentence instead of typing out the words and sings the song at the reception while everyone dances on the dance floor. So that is Jem performing at the wedding reception. Does that make it better or worse? How do we feel? It's not exactly an artist that everybody knows. I feel like I feel like that's a it's not like when Wilson Phillips shows up to sing (laughs) Hold On at the end of Bridesmaids like it's. It's not like where people were sure. sitting at home going, holy shit, that's Jem. They got Jem to be there. How so, did they like... get Jem? How did they ever <laughs> shell out the cash for Jem? We need to get a meme of like that scene from Jurassic Park. And it's like, Jem, everyone, we got Jem here. Yeah. <laughs> See, nobody cares. Um, <laughs> yeah, even if you search Jem, the first thing that comes up is the TV series, Jem and the Holograms. Yeah. Uh, See a Welsh singer and musician. I'm just trying to see if there's any. Uh, she's from Wales. Yeah. Okay. That explains it. <laughs> Wales yeah. hates singing covers with the same lyrics for gender pronouns. That's yes. The, what I've heard about well, Welsh people. Jim Jim has not had a very active career, I must say. <laughs> first first Is this an episode of out? One Hit Thunder that's sneaking it, it in there? Be. <laughs> it's sneak it's sneakily is becoming one. First album came out in 2004, second album 2008, and third album was 2016. So she she took a nice 8-year she, she hiatus. Let that one cook. Let it cook. <laughs> yeah, Be- Beachwood Canyon, she 8 years, the long awaited 8-year return from Jam. Yeah. Um all right, well then let's dive into some pop culture before we wrap this bad boy up. What is something pop culture based that you have uh, been been indulging in, enjoying, want to tell people about? And also tell people where they can check out all your music. Yeah, and I stuff can tell too, you that too. Um, yeah, I, I play uh, play music. I have a solo thing called Team Goldie. Uh, Team Goldie dot com. Team Goldie PHL on Instagram and Twitter and all of the places. Uh, a couple singles that are out now and a new album coming later this year. So keep an eye out for that. Um, Pop culture stuff that I'm into right now. There is, this is kind of like a double dip. Um, There's a podcast about a band that I've been listening to. I am discovered it, way behind on it. Uh, It is called, I have to look it up because it has a really long, (laughs) the title's too long. Uh, (laughs) What's with these homies talking about Weezer? So there's this guy who is, uh, his name's Matt Apodaca. He's part of like UCB kind of, squad but he uh, did this deep dive Weezer podcast that's actually really entertaining he goes album by album and does like the b-sides and has gone through and done everything has some really interesting guests um, some folks that have worked with Weezer some you know comedians and things like that but uh, very entertaining podcast for anyone that loves Weezer as much as I do if you don't like Weezer I you should probably not listen to it but <laughs> I'm subscribing already to it. For anyone who doesn't like Weezer, though, another thing that I, I pop culture recently was super into. Um, I got into Veronica Mars really late. That's probably more relevant to oh. people who like uh, the OC. But just recently watched the uh, most recent season of Veronica Mars. It was on Hulu. Uh, loved it. It was awesome. It coincided with a trip. Uh, I was out in California earlier this year for about five weeks. And we went to Redondo Beach and we saw... All of the sites of the OC. That was not the intention, but it happened. Got to see the diner and all. Now, every time I watch the show, I see the stuff in the background. But we also rode bikes past the Sea Sprite Hotel, which is in season four of Veronica Mars. So that was pretty cool. And also, yeah. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar wrote an episode of that show. Does, did, did we know this? Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, he's a writer. It's wild. He like, writes shows now. It's so strange. Um, I was watching it. I was like, it's weird. There's another guy named Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. And then I looked it up. <laughs> I was like, oh no, it's actually Kareem that wrote this episode. Yes, Veronica Mars. This is like my hottest take on Veronica Mars. I love that show, but I think that it is absolutely hilarious. The tone shift from season two on the UPN to season three on the CW, where it's like season one, she's got to solve who raped her and who murdered her best friend. And like season two, it's like she's got to solve who killed a school bus of kids. And then season three, it's like someone stole the dancers to the test. All of the cases <laughs> get so lame when they move to the CW for that final season. And it's like almost infuriating because you're like, why, why would you? Why this late in the yeah. show? Are you just like, now it's just a wacky show about solving school mysteries. The rebooted season on Hulu Great. returns yeah. it back to the darkness, which like I wasn't ready for. But like upon reflection, like I sat with it for like a, a couple days afterwards. And I was like, no, this is the reason why it was so popular. Yeah. But I will not hear the only good thing. Well, I was going to say I wasn't going to hear any hate about season three, but there's plenty of hate to go around. Um, the only thing that I love about season three is the introduction of Piznarski yes. because I was like, I, well, I mean, again, I talk about like, you know, another route <laughs> of mine, yeah. the uh, introduction of, uh, yes, yeah. we'll, t- we'll talk about that off air. I don't want to spoil any, uh, Veronica Mars for potential listeners. Well, and Matt, if, if you were weirded out by the, uh, the Veronica Mars tone shift, I, I have said to you before, I'm a huge fan and proponent of the fourth season of the OC, which is a radical tone shift, even more so just having rewatched it again. I'm so excited for you to... to... You're the only person I know who's like rides hard for that season. Why is everyone else so wrong? (laughs) I will say that the series finale is very good. It is. It is very good. I think the series finale... It's fantastic. Uh, my my pop culture promo is going to be kind of quick and short. Uh, I already made a reference to Garden State. Uh, a couple months ago, Zach Braff released another truly great movie that he made called A Good Person, uh, starring Florence Pugh. I feel like it did not get nearly enough attention or credit. Um, I remember actually calling my brother shortly after it came out because him and I are both huge Zach, Zach Braff directing fans. Um and obviously he's done like, you know, rehab stuff and AA stuff. So I was like, how accurate is that movie? And he's like, they, he's like, it's one of the first movies that they actually really like they did their research. It's definitely the way more of a drama than a dramedy uh, from Zach Braff. And mm-hmm. I, I, I enjoyed it quite a bit. I think more people should check it out. And it's probably going to be available on streaming or something by now. So uh, that's all I've got. And Joe, how about you take us home with your pop culture promo? So I'm going to say that I'm not sure when this is going to come out. I think it'll still be June. Um, So uh, happy Pride Month for all of you. And uh, my pop culture is the pop culture moment that's kind of sweeping large swaths of homosexuality, gay male homosexuality, I should say, uh, which is Kylie Minogue's new single, Padam Padam. (laughs) I don't know this one. Oh, it is like, first of all, Kylie, Queen of Melbourne, First of her name, Mother of Dragons, is <laughs> Mother of Dragons. <laughs> knows exactly what she's doing by releasing this like gay dance hit, like at the like at the last two weeks of just in time for like Memorial Day weekend. So that way she can start garnering all of the buzz and clout heading into Pride season. And it's like sweeping gay Twitter, uh, like the memes, everything is just so good. And the song itself, I mean, again, is it Kylie's best song? No. Is it, does it do a really good job of getting you in the mood to like dance with a stranger and do poppers? Probably. <laughs> um, so I highly encourage all of you to listen to the gay anthem, if not like the anthem of the summer. Uh, which is, and I'm like a person who, I don't think I've ever mentioned this to you, uh, Matt, but I'm like a person who I'm always looking for what the song of the summer is. Like, I want to know what, like, what is the song that we are going to tie to this moment, like these warm months, you know, for the next three, four months. And so Padam Padam right now is the song. (laughs) And you you have to listen to me. (laughs) A -A P-A-D-A-M. P-A-D-A-M twice, so the word twice. Okay. 
and you have to listen to the song to kind of understand what it means but the whole like the the memes that are going around on gay twitter it's like people are like what does it mean what does padam padam mean and then like it sounds like based on the name i was like oh is this going to be some sort of like appropriated bollywood song and it's not but it could be very easily my brain just goes <laughs> just... to little drummer boy yeah uh, yes <laughs> yeah. so check it out <laughs> You will not you will not uh, regret it. And if you want to have your own little pride parade walking around your house, doing poppers, you know, <laughs> yes, do do poppers. Take a take a hit of poppers, <laughs> and just you know, like. And I'm someone who hates poppers, but this song makes me want to do. It. I'm like, I feel like I should do poppers to the song right now. So padam padam, everybody. All right. Well, this was an Sold. episode filled with a lot of white people problems, and I have a feeling that there's still many more white people problems around the horizon. So we'll be back next week with even more white people problems. listening to the Geekscape Network.